Hi, today I'm going to share some of my experience building and designing ML infrastructure at Netflix. For many people, ML at Netflix is synonymous with our recommendation systems. When you log into Netflix, every single element of the user interface is personalized to your taste. But our usage of ML actually goes much beyond that. We have significant investments in a diverse set of areas, from figuring out how to accurately value content for our service, to fighting payment fraud, service abuse, as one of the biggest studios, we rely on data science for efficient content production. We have to figure out efficient shoot schedules, do automated QA of raw footage, figure out opportunities on how we can advertise efficiently to non-members, as well as making sure that our existing members never run into rebuffers. Today, I'm going to talk about some of the recent work we have done in supporting all of these broad and diverse use cases. I'm going to focus more on some of the higher level design principles with the hope that some of those might be useful to you in your day-to-day -day work. All of the work that I'm going to talk about today is now open source and is broadly available on GitHub. Since we are building infrastructure, specifically machine learning infrastructure, to cater to a wide variety of use cases, it is important to understand what are some of the common concerns that cut across horizontally in each of these use cases. Let's start by looking at the day-to-day -day life of a data scientist who is working on any of these projects and what does their stack look like? Any ML project starts with data. So our data scientists need to be able to reliably and efficiently query the data warehouse to find the data that they need. This data could be, say, Amazon S3 that Netflix uses, could be Google's GCS, Azure's Blob Store, could be some other distributed file system like HDFS. But usually many organizations, they tend to keep their data in one of these data warehouses. Once, as a data scientist, you have access to this data, to perform any transformation on this data set, you need access to compute resources. Oftentimes, that's their laptop. Many times, it could be the cloud as well, say, Kubernetes cluster. Next comes the question of how this compute would be orchestrated on these compute resources. Are you simply going to submit these jobs one after the other, calling some API? Are you going to rely on a workflow scheduler like Airflow to string together your compute? Once you have these layers sorted out, as an end user, you need to understand how to essentially start writing your code against the APIs exposed to you so that you can actually perform the compute, you can actually train the models that you intend to do. How would you like to architect your code? And notice that you know up until now, there's very little ML-specific stuff that we have spoken about. It's very much like cookie cutter software engineering, systems engineering. It's above this level that we sort of like start getting into the realm of machine learning through model operations. ML development is a highly iterative and experimental exercise. So, you know, as an end user, you have to worry about keeping track of all your different experiments, all your hyperparameters, your models. Maybe you rely on some best practices. Maybe you have baked these best practices into your coding standards. Maybe you use some off-the-shelf tooling. Maybe you work for a big company where, you know, you have a dedicated team that is building some of the specific tooling for you. And finally, at the very top of the stack is all the tooling for actually training your models. This includes your favorite IDE, your feature engineering code, your favorite ML frameworks like TensorFlow, PyTorch, maybe you, know, you might just want to roll your own algorithm implementation. Now, what's interesting is that from a data scientist's point of view, they deeply care about what tools they have at their disposal at the very top of their stack. They'll have strong opinions on whether they want to use TensorFlow or PyTorch. Uh, they'll have preferences about their favorite IDE. But at the lower levels, they don't really have express opinions. They don't care if their GPU is coming from a Kubernetes cluster or a server rack hidden in somebody's closet, as long as they have quick and easy access to that GPU. Same for that data as well. They don't care if that data is stored in Parquet format or ORC, as long as they can very quickly and reliably query that data. But unfortunately, in any organization, while it's easy to get off-the-shelf tooling for layers of the stack that are higher, there has been significant progress that has been made in the open source community. Still, a lot of effort is needed to set up and maintain the lower levels of the stack. How do you set up your data warehouse? What are some of the best practices in terms of writing data to that data warehouse? How do you set up and maintain your Kubernetes cluster? How do you orchestrate that compute? So on, so on. And these are the details that a data scientist wouldn't ideally want to get into. This was indeed our observation at Netflix as well. And we essentially decided to build a framework that will allow our data scientists to move across these layers easily while affording them complete freedom and flexibility of tooling at the top layers of the stack. 
Metaflow is Netflix's ML framework geared towards increasing the productivity of data scientists by helping them focus on data science and not engineering. It's an open source project that's available on GitHub uh, that you can take a look at. And in today's talk, I'll essentially talk about some of the higher level principles that we learned the hard way while building Metaflow. Each of the layers that I spoke of just a couple of minutes ago are huge daunting pieces of infrastructure by themselves. ML infrastructure is such a broad field that we can talk about any of these layers for hours and we would still have barely scratched the surface. Given that I have your attention for the next 15, 20 minutes, I'm going to focus on three specific layers of the stack, namely architecture, job scheduler, and compute resources, and talk about how we view these layers in our experience, how these layers should interact with one another to provide a productive experience to our data scientists. A very natural paradigm for expressing data processing pipelines, uh, machine learning in particular, is that of a DAG, a directed acyclic graph. In this example, we have a DAG, the first step, the user is fetching some data, maybe they are doing some feature engineering on it, then maybe they decided that they need to train two different models. Maybe they are just playing around with different hyperparameters, and they want to choose the best one to publish at the end of it. At this level, the DAG doesn't really say anything about what codes get executed or where it is executed. It's mostly about how the data scientist wants to structure their code. This concept of a DAG, its utility is predominantly in helping data scientists organize their work conceptually. If we zoom in a bit into this notion of a DAG, there are three distinct layers that we'll see. There's this fundamental layer of architecture where the user has defined what code needs to execute. And then there's this encompassing layer of a job scheduler, which dictates how the code will be executed. And then we have this layer of compute, which dictates where the code is going to execute. And if you look around in many ex existing systems, they require kind of like a tight coupling between these layers, which was often necessitated by infrastructural limitations that predated the cloud. As an example, the user may have to specify their code using a custom DSL, which limits the kind of work that they can do. And this DSL may have to be executed with a built-in specific scheduler that is then again very tightly coupled with the compute layer. Now, while this tight coupling may be justified for domain-specific use cases, say, you know, high-performance computing, when you're building infrastructure to support hundreds of different use cases from natural language processing to classical statistics, you'd ideally want these layers to be decoupled so that the user can choose which layer to use when. And this was inherently the motivation for Metaflow. With Metaflow, our data scientists can architect their modeling code in languages and libraries that they're familiar with. They can leverage the rich data science ecosystem in Python and R without any limitation the user's code gets packaged for the compute layer by Metaflow so that the user can focus on their code rather than say, you know, writing Docker files. Finally, the scheduling layer takes care of executing the individual functions using the compute layer. From the data scientist's point of view, the infrastructure works exactly as it should. They can write idiomatic modeling code, use familiar abstractions, and their code gets executed without hassle, even at massive scale. So how does it work in practice? There are many ideas that make complete theoretical sense, but might fall flat when they face reality. Let's, let's look at Metaflow's programming model and see if it actually really works in practice. Data scientists, when they use Metaflow, they can structure their workflow as a directed acyclic graph of steps as depicted in this diagram. The steps can be arbitrary Python code. In this hypothetical example, we have a variable x uh, that is incremented by two steps, uh, a and b, a incremented by two, b incremented by three. And both of them execute in parallel because if you notice, uh, step a uh, it essentially transitions into two steps in parallel, step a and step b. And in the joint step, we essentially take the maximum of the, those two concurrently existing values of x. Now, in the case of Metaflow, defining a DAG is as simple as annotating your functions with the add step decorator for nodes of your graph. And for edges, you can simply specify the transitions using the self.next method calls. Now, given that any of these steps are just executing arbitrary Python code, you can literally use any library available to you in the Python universe. Metaflow by itself does not place any constraints on that. 
at Netflix, we even do have a significant number of users who are committed to R Lang. So we do provide a similar package in R as well for them with exactly the same set of capabilities. Also note how the value of X was available both to step A and B, and then two copies of X, one with the value of two and the other with the value of three are now both available concurrently in this joint step. Metaflow is essentially taking care of state transfer out of the box so that the user doesn't have to worry about any of the data flow details. And this, this paradigm by itself, this notion of arranging your work in this DAG paradigm is really powerful since it very simply allows our users to properly organize and visualize their work that sort of like gets them a lot further than their imperative style of uh, writing code. Now, once the user has specified their workflow, there could be a scenario that they lack the ability to execute some or all of the steps of their workflow on their laptop. Uh, this, is, this is pretty common, you know, if you say you need to train a model uh, that needs access to GPUs or maybe it needs access to many more cores of CPUs than you have already available to you. Maybe you want to process a huge data frame that needs 200 gigs of RAM and your laptop just is bottleneck that 16 gigs of RAM. Now, in Metaflow, the user can easily declare the compute layer for their steps, and Metaflow will ensure that these steps get executed on that compute layer. In this example, specifying the add resources decorator is akin to the user saying that, hey, this step needs to execute on a cloud instance with four GPUs. Note that in this example, the user never had to specify how their code is getting packaged, uh, how are they baking a Docker container, uh, if let's say eventually the code is running on top of a Kubernetes cluster, they don't have to deal with a Kubernetes API, or even you know when we move a compute unit from their laptop uh, to the cloud, they still need access to the raw data. And Metaflow takes care of moving around data, dealing with the underlying compute layer behind the scenes for the user so that the user doesn't have to focus on that. Many times, uh, it's not only the resources that might be a constraint. Uh, maybe you might want to process some sensitive data that you don't have access to on your laptop. Uh, at Netflix, this is a very common use case. Uh, so at Netflix, some of the teams, uh, they have built this amazing compute system called Archer, uh, which provides access to all the media files, all the raw footage from our TV shows and movies in a secure environment. In this scenario, in this DAG that you have, maybe all you want to do is some summarization on some media files in your start step but you don't want any of your other steps to execute in this secure environment that Archer provides. And you can now very simply just annotate one of your steps with at Archer, and then Metaflow will figure out how to package your compute and execute the compute on Archer in a very secure and stable manner. Now, once the user has specified a workflow, orchestrating the execution of the DAG belongs to the job scheduler layer. The scheduling layer doesn't need to care about what code is being executed. Its sole responsibility is to schedule the steps in the topological order, making sure that a step finishes successfully before its successors in the graph are executed. Metaflow ships with a local scheduler, which makes it easy to test workflows locally on laptop or on the cloud. While the built-in scheduler is fully functional in the sense that you know it executes the steps in a topological order and can handle workflows with tens and thousands of tasks, it lacks support for triggering workflows, for alerting and monitoring on failures by design. And since we've been talking about the value of interchangeable layers so far, like rather than build yet another production-grade DAG scheduler by ourselves, we can very simply just combine this DAG into something that a production DAG scheduler understands. You know, like most DAG schedulers, at the end of the day, they are executing a graph. We already have a representation of the graph from the user. So it should be rather straightforward for us to write a compiler that can compile down to something that the scheduler understands. Another benefit uh, that I want to highlight here is that uh, when we were building Metaflow, we wanted to provide strong guarantees about backward compatibility to the user-facing API, the API against which the user writes code. So the user can now write their code confidently, knowing that Metaflow will schedule and execute their code without changes, even if the underlying scheduling and computing layer evolves over time. For example, you know, if you have specified at resources decorator, we might be launching that step on a Kubernetes cluster, and that Kubernetes cluster might evolve, the underlying APIs might change, but the user doesn't have to 
take any explicit action on their end because Metaflow will take care of evolving along with the underlying layers while providing a consistently stable API to the end user. And this, this eases the burden on part of the user where they don't have to go through a migration pain as the world evolves with the, uh, beneath them. Here's an example of executing the flow locally using Metaflow's built-in scheduler. Metaflow will validate the workflow, making sure it's a well-defined workflow. It will assign the execution a unique ID so that you can inspect the state of the execution at any point of time in the future. Any steps marked with a specific compute environment, say add resources at Archer, maybe you know, have written your own decorator, they'll get executed in those environments and Metaflow will pipe back the logs to their console. If say the user specified 200 gigs of RAM with the at resources decorator for one step, to them it would feel like suddenly somebody came in, swapped out their laptop with a bigger laptop that had 200 gigs of RAM. And they didn't have to take any specific action besides specifying that decorator. And at the end of the day, this is incredibly productive for our users because then they can squarely focus on their business logic, on their code, their machine learning training code, and all the underlying uh, systems, engineering integrities are just abstracted away by the library. For integrating with production schedulers, uh, currently Metaflow has two integrations. In open source version, we have an integration with um, AWS Step Functions. Uh, which is a managed offering by AWS. Uh, it's highly available, scales out incredibly well to thousands of tasks in a given workflow, as well as thousands of concurrently running workflow. And more importantly, it's a managed service by AWS, so it has zero operational burden. And with one single CLI command, Python, flow.py, step functions, create, you can export your Metaflow workflow to step functions. Metaflow will, behind the scenes, compile your workflow into a language that Step Functions understands. And you, as a user, you have literally no need to familiarize yourself with the documentation of the SDK that Step Functions ships or understand any of the integrities. All of those concerns are abstracted away. And the great thing about uh, a scheduler like Step Functions is that it integrates further with the rest of the AWS infrastructure, so you don't have to take any explicit action. All of your logs would be made available in CloudWatch. All of the alerting and monitoring is available to you out of the box. We also have a similar in internal integration with Netflix's Mason, which is a production scheduler. It's, it's internal to Netflix. We haven't been able to open source it yet. And that's where most of our machine learning pipelines execute. And again, our users, they don't ever have to worry about the API that Mason exposes or how it evolves behind the scenes. Just very recently, the team behind Mason, they did a migration uh, where they migrated all of their users from one version of uh, their SDK to another. And none of the users of Metaflow had to take any specific action to migrate. All of their workflows just migrated behind the scenes because all we had to do was change the API integration that Metaflow had with me. Now, I'm almost out of time, uh, but before I leave you, I want to highlight some of the key takeaways from today's talk. The primary one being that Problems at the end of the day, they're solved by humans and not tools. So we should build our tooling with human centricity, keeping our end users at the center. Our users, they should focus on the details of their ML work and not on the details of compute and scheduling layer that sits beneath them. So decoupling the architecture, job scheduler, and the compute layer, that totally makes sense, at least for our use cases. Now, if any of these ideas resonated with you, uh, Metaflow is an open source project. We also have complimentary sandboxes available for you where you can try out Metaflow's cloud integrations. You can sign in with your GitHub ID and we'll provision you uh, an AWS uh, account with all the infrastructure set up for you so that you can essentially figure out that everything that I spoke about uh, actually really works. And we have lots of documentation available online and uh, we are happy to support you in your ML journey on our chat channel. So uh, please do uh, feel free to reach out. And I'll be happy to take any questions that you might have. Thank you.